When combined with the $630 million reduction in levies in 2012-13, these proposed changes amount to around a 40 per cent lower ACC levy rates for households and businesses. Mr Speaker, the budget also confirms a number of revenue measures and I want to thank the Revenue Minister and United Future Leader Peter Dunn for his work in this area. These measures include proposals to let loss-making start-up businesses claim tax losses on R&D expenditure, together with proposals allowing tax deductibility for certain types of black hole expenditure. Changes to thin capitalisation rules will help to ensure that multinational companies investing in New Zealand contribute their fair share of tax. And inland revenue will receive additional funding of $7 million a year so it can better pursue tax compliance in the area of property investment. This is expected to return about $45 million a year in additional tax revenue. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, proceeds from the Government's share offer programme, including from the Mighty River Power Float last week, are being placed in the Future Investment Fund and will be used to pay for new public assets. The budget confirms another $1.5 billion of investment from the Future Investment Fund. $426 million will be invested in redeveloping Christchurch and Burwood hospitals, which, as previously announced, will be the biggest building project in the history of New Zealand's public health system. Contingencies totalling over $700 million have been set aside for key projects that include new modern schools, Christchurch's Justice and Emergency Services Precinct, and Canterbury Tertiary Education Institutes. The rest of the $1.5 billion investment includes $50 million for the school network upgrades, $94 million for the fourth year of Kiwi Rail's turnaround plan, and $80 million for irrigation infrastructure. Overall, across multiple budgets, the Government intends to spend a total of $1 billion from the Future Investment Fund on 21st century schools and classrooms and $1 billion on priority health investments. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, investing in hospitals, schools and other public assets depends on money coming into the Future Investment Fund through further share offers. Today I can announce that Meridian Energy will be the next company to be prepared for a partial share offer in the second half of 2013. As with Mighty River Power, New Zealanders will be at the front of the queue for shares in Meridian, and we will be targeting widespread New Zealand ownership. The Government's share offer programme remains important for the Government's books and for the economy. As well as raising money to invest in new public assets, it benefits the companies themselves through greater market discipline. In addition, the share offer programme gives New Zealand savers the opportunity to invest in large New Zealand businesses. Mr Speaker, housing can be made more affordable in New Zealand by focusing on the key areas that actually make a difference – land supply, consent processes, provision of infrastructure and productivity in the construction sector. The Government is working with councils on these issues because the decisions they make about housing affect the entire economy. High housing costs affect financial stability and create an increased demand for housing assistance. Today, we are introducing legislation to speed up the provision of new housing in areas where the pressure is greatest and housing is least affordable. Special housing areas will be designated under accords between the government and councils. Council approvals for new housing in those areas can be managed under a streamlined process. Where agreement cannot be reached or targets aren't met, the government will be able to issue the consents itself. This legislation, which will apply for three years, is an immediate response to housing pressures in areas facing severe affordability problems. It gives time for the government's resource management changes to bear fruit and address land and housing supply issues in the longer term. 
Mr Speaker, alongside the budget, the government is confirming measures to help ensure New Zealand's financial stability. Earlier this week, the Reserve Bank Governor and I signed a memorandum of understanding that gives the Reserve Bank the ability to require banks to hold additional capital on their balance sheet as a buffer during an economy-wide credit boom, to hold additional capital against loans in specific sectors if risks emerge in those sectors, to use more stable sources of funding to avoid short-term funding shortages, and to restrict high loan-to-value ratio lending in the housing sector. These measures will be available, if required, to help protect the economy and the financial system from boom and bust cycles. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Government's third priority for this term is delivering better public services within tight financial constraints. Spending restraint is not a handbrake on providing better public services. In fact, big increases in spending have often been a measure of failure rather than a measure of success. Our approach has been to spend well, not always to spend more. The government's spending increases have been modest and focused on programmes that will achieve results and improve the lives of New Zealanders and their families. Last year, the Prime Minister set 10 challenging results for the public sector to achieve over the next few years in areas such as reducing long-term welfare dependency, supporting vulnerable children, boosting skills and employment, and reducing crime. These results span the public sector and the budget contributes to meeting all of them. Mr Speaker, I want to start with the government's support for vulnerable children and families. This is already very substantial, with billions of dollars spent on income support as well as targeted support for families with complex needs. The Ministerial Committee on Poverty was established under the Confidence and Supply Agreement between the National and Maori Parties. And I want to acknowledge my fellow Minister and Māori Party co-leader Tariana Turia for her support. The Budget confirms several important initiatives in this area. Funding of $100 million over three years has been provided for the Healthy Homes Insulation Programme, targeting low-income households with children or high health needs. The The extended program is expected to insulate around 46,000 additional houses. More than $21 million has been provided over the next four years for rheumatic fever prevention. Another $1.5 million has been provided next year for budgeting services for low-income families on top of the $8.9 million that is already provided. Yeah, the government is also exploring a Warrant of Fitness program for social housing and will investigate a pilot and will investigate and pilot a low and no interest loan scheme for low income borrowers. Some of these initiatives were included in the Children's Commissioner's Child Poverty Report, which the government will be responding to in the next few weeks. Mr Speaker, it is widely acknowledged that paid employment is the best way to lift vulnerable families out of poverty. That's why the government is focused on helping these families by creating conditions where businesses are prepared to invest and to take on new staff. And it's why the government's welfare policies have an unrelenting focus on supporting people into work. The budget provides $180 million over four years for the next stage of welfare reform. This includes funding for more intensive case management for people who are able to work and means that work and income staff will be actively working with over 40 per cent of all beneficiaries. Mr Speaker, despite the government's $15 billion investment in housing, some people cannot get social housing assistance when they need it. The provision of social housing is also dominated by Housing New Zealand with relatively few other providers. The Government is therefore announcing three major changes. First, we will begin developing pathways for New Zealanders in social housing to regain independence and self-sufficiency in housing as their individual circumstances permit 
and as alternatives allow. Reviewable tenancies, which already apply to some housing New Zealand tenants, will then be progressively extended to all social housing tenants. This will mean people can be in social housing when they have high needs and for as long as those needs persist, but they will be given support to move into alternative housing when their situation improves and they are in a position to take that step to independence. Yeah, yeah. This will free up houses for other people and families with high needs who would otherwise be shut out of social housing. The budget contains funding of $47 million to support this policy starting in 2015-16. Second, the Government is increasing its spending on income-related rent subsidies by $27 million over four years and will make this available as a capped pool to community housing providers. Opening income-related rents up to community housing providers puts them on an equal footing with Housing New Zealand and opens the door for much greater participation in the social housing sector. Finally, housing needs assessment will be shifted from Housing New Zealand to the Ministry of Social Development. This means needs assessment will be independent of any housing provider, and people seeking different types of government assistance can get it from one organisation. Mr Speaker, the Government has made frontline health services a priority, and this is benefiting many more New Zealanders and their families. Elective surgery procedures, for example, have increased significantly. Emergency room waiting times have dropped, more MRI and CT scans have been performed, and more children have been immunised. The Budget continues the Government's focus on better health care and prevention. It includes $1.6 billion over the next four years for new initiatives and to meet cost pressures and population growth. One billion of that funding over four years will go to district health boards to cover demographic growth and cost pressures. $70 million has been set aside for aged care and dementia services. $48 million for more elective operations. $36 million for heart disease and diabetes care and $25 million for pre preventative screening services. <laughs> the Government is also providing $92 million over four years to pay family members who care for their disabled adult children. The additional funding in the budget takes the total health budget next year to $14.7 billion. Mr Speaker, the Government is helping more New Zealanders get the skills they need to build successful careers and fulfil their potential. We are lifting student achievement at all levels of the education system, making more information available to parents and lifting the quality of teaching and professional leadership in our schools. We have set ambitious targets for student achievement. In particular, we want to have 98% of school entrants having participated in early childhood education yeah, yeah. and 85% of 18-year-olds achieving NCEA Level 2 or the equivalent qualification. The Government's total investment in education will next year increase to over $9.7 billion. Over the next four years, the budget provides new operating funding of $173 million for early childhood education and $215 million for schools, including nearly $80 million for operations grants. It also provides $134 million in capital for new school property. Our particular focus is on supporting children who have too often missed out on educational opportunities. The budget therefore provides $41 million to support vulnerable children to participate in early childhood education and $6 million for a new mentoring program to help vulnerable students achieve NCEA Level 2. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, the budget also includes over $130 million of new investment and reprioritised funding in tertiary education over the next four years. Extra funding is provided for Maori and Pacifica trades training to boost science and engineering courses 
and to increase the proportion of young people with higher level qualifications. The budget also confirms funding to support the new and expanded apprenticeship system the Prime Minister announced earlier this year. The reprioritisation of tertiary funding includes initiatives to increase repayment of student loans from overseas-based borrowers and reduce defaulting. The Government is also reining in big rises in student allowance costs by focusing on younger learners and on people studying for their first degrees. People aged 40 and over will be restricted to 120 weeks of student allowances, while people aged 65 and over will no longer be eligible for an allowance. Students of all ages will continue to have access to the interest-free student loan scheme. The Budget also invests in expanding the Māori Cadetship Programme, which will increase the number of cadets from 250 to 350 each year. I want to acknowledge Māori Affairs Minister and Māori Party co-leader Peter Sharples for his leadership and support in this area. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, over the last four and a half years, the Government has had a comprehensive programme of reform to protect communities, prevent crime and put victims first. This is delivering results. Reported crime has fallen by almost 17 per cent over the past three years. Oh, yeah. Our justice agencies are focused on areas that will get the best results in the future. The Department of Corrections, for example, is investing $10 million over two years to reduce offending by prisoners after they are released. And as previously announced, the police are investing more than $160 million over a number of years to give frontline officers access to new technology, such as smartphones and tablets, which means they can deal with issues on the street without having to return to the station to do paperwork. Mr Speaker, the Government's fourth priority is to support the rebuilding of Christchurch. Since the first earthquake almost three years ago, the Government has made it clear that it will stand beside the people of Canterbury as they rebuild their lives and their communities. I want to pay tribute to my colleague Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Minister Jerry Brownlee and the many public servants, community organisations and families who continue to work so hard to help each other through the many challenges that remain in their community. Considerable progress has been made. The Skirt Infrastructure Alliance has completed $700 million worth of work, with another $400 million under construction. The demolition of nearly 1,000 buildings in the Christchurch CBD has almost finished, and the cordon will be removed at the end of June. And by the end of this month, the Earthquake Commission will have completed 38,000 repairs and paid out more than $5.3 billion in claims. The Treasury has recently increased its estimate of the total rebuilding costs from $30 billion to $40 billion, the equivalent of almost 20 per cent of New Zealand's annual GDP. The Government's share of that total cost will be significant. On current estimates, around $7.6 billion will be incurred by the Earthquake Commission and other Crown entities. Direct government support amounts to another $7.6 million, making a total Crown contribution of around $15.2 billion. Of the government's direct support, $5.5 billion has already been allocated through the Can Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Fund, which was established two years ago and is now fully committed. This budget confirms an additional $2.1 billion of operating and capital spending to further support the rebuilding of our second biggest city. Over $900 million of this funding comes from the Future Investment Fund for projects including redeveloping Christchurch hospitals, establishing a justice and emergency service precinct and supporting tertiary education institutes. The Government is also investing $300 million in anchor projects 
for the Christchurch City Centre and almost $650 million of additional capital funding from departmental balance sheets will be used for health and education projects in Canterbury. Mr Speaker, New Zealand is on the right track. That's right. Yeah. 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 The government's books are the envy of most developed countries. The economy is growing and families are benefiting from that. The country is seeing the benefit of improved public services that are focused on getting results. Things haven't always been easy, but as a nation, we have coped with adversity and we are now making real progress. We are seeing the benefits of the government's program of sensible, responsible change. There are a lot of opportunities ahead of us as a country, providing we stick to the plan the government has set out. I'm confident we will grasp those opportunities and keep building the brighter future.